Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. First things first, apologies for this slight delay. Um, YouTube uh, has been having some technical issues due to the bandwidth. Uh, I guess a lot of people are connected uh, on YouTube right now because of the confinement. Anyway, we're here now, so without further ado, welcome to the fifth episode of our free weekly live webinars brought to you by the Football Business Academy in partnership with Socrates. My name is Christian Dobrev. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer of the FBA, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Now, as always, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who tuned in for last week's episodes, in which together with Rebecca Smith, Misha Sher, Anna Chanduvi, and Marcus Bartosz, we looked at what the effects are of COVID-19 on the media and broadcasting landscape. If you missed it, no worries, it's available on our YouTube channel, or if you prefer an audio version, you can always also access it by Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just looking for the FBA podcast, okay? So for those of you who are new and hadn't heard of the FBA before, we are a Swiss-based educational institution entirely dedicated to the football industry. We run a professional master in football business, and we also run a number of certifi certificates around the world. Today, we'll look at the commercial landscape with perspectives as wide ranging as those of a confederation, of a club, of an agency, and of course, of a brand. So our guests today, they will share their insights and see how they're navigating this important area of the business and what the future might hold for the sponsorships and partnerships of this world. To start, we have Heidi Pellerano, who is the Chief Commercial Officer at CONCACAF, which is the Confederation of North, Central American, and Caribbean Association of Football. Welcome, Heidi. Then we have Clément Michon from FBA Partners Olympique Lyonnais. Clément heads up the international department of the French club. Hi, Clément. Then we also have uh, the pleasure to welcome Kirsten Lutz from Team Marketing, who uh, is Managing Director of Partnerships Management. Now, for those of you who may not have heard of Team Marketing, they are the exclusive commercial agency for UEFA's club competitions. Hi, Kirsten. And last but not least, we have Steve Day, who heads up Visa's sponsorship efforts across the European Union. Welcome, Steve. Welcome to all four of you. Indeed, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. So there he is. Great, Steve. Um, Heidi, I'd like to begin with you because as much as anyone would, would want to talk um, about when it's all going to start, it's obviously up to the competition organizers to, to decide that, right? After the governments and the medical authorities, naturally. But at CONCACAF, um, you, you obviously organize a number of club competitions and national competitions. And apart from the, the participating teams and the fans, I'm, I'm guessing that the commercial partners are one of those kind of like, you know, big stakeholders that are wondering, you know, what's going to happen when it's going to happen. So my first question to you is, what, what is happening right now or since the, the, the confinement started really? in terms of, you know, internally at CONCACAF and, and how you, you look at those processes, what's the top, the top reason uh, behind how you, how you look ahead? Absolutely, thank you for, first of all, good morning or good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be part of this session with all of you. Um, I think it's a great question, Christian. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm sure all of my colleagues on this uh, webinar probably share the same feeling. Above all else is the safety. Is the safety of our fans, is the safety of our players, and it's the safety of everybody involved in, in the game. There was a great article over the weekend that says even putting a game behind closed doors could require over 200 people to make sure that it's able to be held from a security perspective, operational, when you start talking about uh, putting it on television. So it's not a small undertaking. So the biggest thing for us is that we will uh, play football when it is the right time to play football for all the parties involved. So what we've been doing is like probably everybody else is we have five, 10 different scenarios. Um, you know, we are very much have to work around uh, the FIFA windows for our competitions uh, that are national teams. Uh, we also work with our partners on the club side. So obviously until their leagues are not playing, uh, we're not gonna be playing either. I think the biggest 
a hurdle for all of us in the sport outside of the safety of everybody involved is really how do we start having countries and cities come on board. You take a country like the United States, um, 50 states, very different scenarios in the two coasts, California and New York versus the rest of, of the country. So how do we come on board will really depend on when it's right timing, borders are open and we're able to fly our teams in. And I think our partners understand that. And the way we've done it is constant, uh, probably over communication, just to let them know everything we know, we share with them, uh, every contingency that we're working, we share with them so that we can hear their input as well. So we can take that into consideration with planning the different scenarios. Yeah, I can only imagine how, how complicated that all must be. But as, uh, as you said, it's, it's, it's as much about planning as it's about communication, right? So speaking of that, Stephen, I'd like to uh, ask you a question. Obviously, Visa is a, is a major sponsor, uh, specifically in sports as well, um, ranging from FIFA and UEFA to the Olympics, uh, even NFL. What direct impact has COVID-19 had on the different events and athletes that you guys sponsor um, or activate through your brand? Yeah, well, as, as you say, Christian, we, um, we sponsor some of the biggest sporting events in the world. So yeah, FIFA, NFL, Olympics, and as part of that as well, we have athlete contracts. So since the year 2000, I think we've had over 500 athletes as part of Team Visa. Um, for this Olympics round, we have about 90 plus athletes. And with the postponement of the Olympics, then obviously that was gonna change everything for those athletes. We didn't want them to be out of pocket. We didn't want them to be worried about what might happen to them. So, so we've extended the contracts of all those 90 plus athletes uh, by an extra year so that they didn't have to worry about whether or not they would be getting their team visa contracts. They can concentrate on actually preparing for the Olympics. So directly, that's one of the ways in which um, visa has been trying to support the athletes through a difficult time. Great. And what about the, the events, for example, the, the Euros? I was the Euro 2021 was going to be a big moment for visa. That's now pushed back by a full year. What's the impact been uh, on that side? Uh, well, we're still actually waiting for um, confirmation from UEFA on what's happening with women's Euro. Um, obviously the men's Euro has been pushed back by a year uh, to the summer of 21, but we're waiting for official confirmation uh, from UEFA as to how that impacts the women's Euro. Hopefully we should hear by the end of this week, um, but we're obviously putting contingency plans in place. Um, with the Olympics moving out by a year, um, then obviously our plans have changed by a year for Olympics. Um, if we have to move our plans for women's Euros, then we will do that as well. It can be quite flexible in terms of how we, how we cater for all these tournaments. Okay. And uh, Kirsten, obviously as part of your job at Team Marketing, you uh, manage a number of partners across a number of competitions, including the UEFA Champions League, the Europa League, the Women's Champions League uh, and many others. What was the first thing you did when you heard that UEFA was postponing all of its competitions due to the Corona outbreak? I mean, the Women's Champions League we don't look after, unfortunately, but uh, the men's and uh, and uh, the UEL, of course. Well, you know, the first priority is obviously to speak to your partners and make sure they have all the information that we have and that UEFA can give to the partners. So there was a lot of, especially the first two weeks after the lockdown, there was a lot, a lot of uh, discussions and phone calls and gathering information and listening to their concerns. So um, that that's really the first step. You want to make sure they the, the partners feel looked after and, and you can share with them whatever you possibly can. Um, but it was... Uh, it's a frantic exercise to do, you know, because it's a new situation for absolutely everybody. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. Um, Clément, uh, your job entails managing the international department at a major football club. And um, of course, when we talk about the commercial landscape, most people think about the, the sponsorships and the partnerships, but there's so much more, right? In terms of commercial opportunities for, for sports properties. Can you tell us a little bit more about how, uh, how this has affected your job and, and what you kind of like were planning to do and now are maybe not in a position to do so anymore? <laughs> yeah, so first, uh, hi to everybody, whatever um, and wherever you are. And thank you, FBA, for, for inviting me for, for this webinar. 
Um, as you said, um, there is many things in commercial opportunities or opportunities as well on international development. And if some of my uh, colleagues do that speak about maybe classes more sponsorship leading to company and, and major events, my one of my main mission is more acts on, on developing corporations and audiences with existing clubs, federations, academy on, on more maybe consulting model for what we um, share, but especially adapt and put available our expertise in academy. So youth education, women's football, medical or uh, infrastructure management, something like that to those partner uh, abroad. And so developing uh, a long-term uh, relationship with them. So supporting them to build their own methodology and, uh, and project. Uh, so it means that more, more than 10 uh, alliances in different forms and in and, and, and eight countries at the moment um, in, in different continents. So uh, I totally agree on, on what said Kirsten, say that the situation is, is uh, totally new for everybody and, and it came really fast. So of course it has impact on, the, on this activity for us uh, because we were having more than 10 action uh, between the, uh, the mid of March and basically the end of May uh, in different countries. So it means of course that we have to uh, temporize and, 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 uh, and wait that the situation will, will be solved. Uh, it has been basically simple and and um, and quick uh, uh, to uh, put on uh, on pause those actions because uh, the situation has been has been evolved uh, in in different parts of the world just um, into the same times. Uh, so basically now we, we what we know for sure is those actions. So sending coaches to work with uh, on-site coaches to work on specific project will be done. Um, what we don't know at the moment is how and when the situation in France would be would permit to move. And second, how and when the situation in each country we are developing those alliances will permit to go. So we are talking in different solutions in part of the world, like India, in Vietnam, South Korea, or, or China, for instance, uh, in Lebanon, in Africa also, like Senegal and Morocco, and or, of course in Brazil and uh, in the United States. So each situation, it's 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 um, topic and, 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 and project to, to follow and, and adapt following the, the context. Okay, great. I'll definitely come back uh, with another question on that. Um, Heidi, back to you now for a second. Um, and Stephen mentioned this, obviously, there's a big reshuffling of, of the sports calendar, right? Um, with, uh, with the Euros, with the, with the Olympics and whatnot. Um, are your partners worried about this at all? Because obviously there's going to be a lot of competition for both venues and, uh, and media slots, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it's definitely very interesting. And I think all of us are, are watching to see how this condensed schedule plays out. Um, obviously, for us, um, we, we, we looked at the calendar last uh, for 2021, and we were going to be in a position that we were going to share the stage gladly with the women's Euros. Uh, but now we're sharing the stage with a lot of competitions. Uh, the interesting thing for when we spoke to our partners about it, we've been very communicative with them to try to figure out the right uh, window of time, both with our sponsors and our TV partners to make sure that we get it right. And there's a couple of things that everybody has shared with us. First is the advantage of the, the difference in time zones. So we're not really going head to head with all the competitions at the same time because of the hit the time zone. And most of our partners, unfortunately, are not partners of some of those other competitions. So they kind of love it. They have something now that they have a platform where they can speak and have an official platform through the sport of football that everybody loves to really talk to their audiences when traditionally some of their competitors are going to be very active. So they're looking forward to that opportunity. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Stephen, how, how do you deal with things like reshuffling budgets and, and staffing resources. I must admit, uh, I, must, I must imagine it's, uh, it's quite the, the chaos to do that, but how, how do you deal with it? Well, I mean, as, as we mentioned before, I mean, Visa sponsor a lot of events. Um, so we have, um, we have a big global team um, and local team within Europe working on uh, various sponsorship events. Um, as things get moved, then obviously priorities change. Um, so we just have to be adaptable and flexible and resilient. Um, so plans change, uh, priorities change, and we, we just move uh, resource around to, to concentrate on the most important parts of the business at that time. Um, we've been quite um, 
fortunate, I think, to be able to, I mean, if you look at the, the next two or three years, there's literally a, every six months, there's a major sporting event that Visa sponsor, be that Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics, Men's World Cup, uh, Women's World Cup, Women's Euros. I mean, they're, they're going to come thick and fast. So we're in a constant um, situation where we're, where we're working on all these sponsorships. It's just a question of moving the resource to focus um, as fits the, t the changing timetable. Thank you. Um, Kirsten, across the different competitions that you um, manage through, through the partners, of course, there's, um, there's different partners, right? There's different categories. Um, did they all react in the same way? I mean, obviously some industries are more affected than others. So were certain uh, partner categories more, um, more worried or how, how, how were their reactions? Like did some maybe even surprise you in how they reacted or was it almost uh, entirely the same over the different partners that you have? I would say at the beginning, it was pretty much the same for everybody. Uh, just everybody wanting to understand what the situation is and, and what the plan is and how UEFA will tackle um, the problem. Um, what I have to say is everybody was extremely understanding of the situation. So there was no pushing, there was no uh, you know, negative uh, feedback. I think everybody knew this is a very, very difficult situation for everybody. Um, I'm pretty sure at one point this will, you know, change a little bit um, where people get anxious to have answers and uh, obviously for UEFA it's even more complex than um, for a league, you know, they have to look across all the leagues and, and including the federations and it, it's, just, it's a beast to get through so it, it's, it's taking uh, some time to go through all that. But the understanding has been great, but some obviously will be hit harder. I think we all know the auto industry is suffering from the situation um, and others are probably more able to cope with that. But we're going to see different requests and um, probably a different urgency of the requests in the next coming weeks. Okay, well, uh, we'll uh, stay tuned to see how that develops then. <laughs> Uh, Clément, back to you. Um, you. You discussed a little bit about what, what your side of uh, your role is. And, and obviously within the commercial landscape, um, for football clubs specifically, pre-season tours are a quite big thing. Uh, many clubs even you know, rely on some of that money coming in. Uh, I can only imagine a club such as Olympique Lyonnais also having had a certain schedule, a certain plan in terms of which friendlies uh, to play, whether individual uh, matches or, or tournaments. What can you tell us about uh, what your plans were for there and, and what kind of like, solutions, uh, <laughs> that, if, if, if any? Yeah. I won't disclose exactly what was what were the project uh, before the COVID uh, for the two teams, because we have the chance to, to have two high competitive teams uh, in men and women's football. Uh, and, and of course, preseason has become from, from the sporting um, necessity to become a new commercial opportunities. Uh, to, to, to visit new markets, to bring fans all around different countries uh, and also as economic uh, assets for the clubs. Um, so it represents, of course, if it represents a few weeks of activation, it, it, it's uh, uh, several months of work, <laughs> basically, um, and work on that. But of course, um, now we are in a situation that we all depend from uh, first the government, the different uh, governmental um, bodies, instruction and then how uh, the, the government body in symbol and, and national leagues would react. Uh, and then uh, after, after having the new schedules for, for the competition, at, at this moment, I, um, of course, the situation is, is different for every country, but in France, we don't know if uh, the league would restart for sure at 100% and uh, when uh, it would restart and hence. So we need to, to wait basically those elements on the, on the two division on, on men and women football. Uh, prior to see if there is, um, if they will have any opportunities of of touring, uh, even on a sporting uh, communication or, or or tour aspect, and then what we can do with that. But but we are all facing a, a, a situation that that affects every every aspect of our industry, and and we are I think that that's the advantage to to let people be highly comprehensive. So. Um, Basically, we are trying to anticipate see what solution we could activate soon when we have uh, all elements clear uh, regarding the context, uh, especially first the sporting expectation. 
but for the moment, we still have to wait. Uh, our this season will end before to consider the the next one. Yeah, th thank you, Clemo. Um, Heidi, I want to talk um, with you about a specific topic as well, because um, there's a lot of speculation in the media. There's also some uh, some viewers on our YouTube chat that are kind of like inquiring about what's the deal with contracts and insurances, right? I mean, we've seen some people suggesting that you know this is a time to to rip up contracts and and <laughs> and pay back certain fees. Um, then we have the likes of Wimbledon, you know, having made this amazing deal back in the day um, with the insurance. What do you think is going to happen there in, in the maybe medium and long term future? Yeah, I mean, I really do think uh, it's going to be very dependent on each partner and the, the, how their contracts were written. I don't think uh, anybody, is, and it's not a templatized uh, format that every language is similar from contract to contract. Um, and I think that's where the dialogue really comes in. Um, you know, for us in particular, where we're an event based. Uh, or competition-based organization, a lot of the dialogue we've been having with our, our partners is specific to the shifting in the schedule because at the end of the day, uh, we will deliver against the, 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 the events that we have on the schedule. It's just the timing that's gonna shift. So a lot of dialogue around that is to listen to them and say, okay, how are you managing through this uh, situation as well? Because you've been impacted uh, as well from a business perspective. So we've been having a lot of dialogue to them with them to see how they're, uh, what marketing plans are they putting in place? How can CONCACAF be part of those plans and help amplify? So we've been, we're not really talking about make goods or anything like that, but we're not there yet. So our whole focus is really on how to be a great partner to them because we expect the same thing if the, when the situation is reversed, that they would be good partners to us and they've proven that to us through history. So one of the things that we try to do above all else is have that conversation, listen to them, look at the plans that they're doing. How can we amplify those plans? A lot of them, as you can imagine, are very content-based, very education. So we've been leveraging our, our athletes and our, some of our staff uh, to be able to create videos on their behalf. We're creating a lot of content ourselves where we're making sure that we integrate them. And then after that, we're also spending a lot of time trying to figure out about the future and how we assure that they're able to come on board and do the things the right way. So if we need to adjust, um, you know, payment schedules and things like that, we're certainly open to having that discussion with them. But for the most part, I think the, the, the biggest thing is, you know, we've talked about is it will be very interesting to see the overall change that will happen in the industry. I'm sure a lot of people are calling now to try to get um, uh, insurance and that's going to be almost cost prohibitive now because everybody is, is doing it uh, at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if people start to spend time trying to figure out what is the next thing that could happen and try to anticipate. So I think crisis managers are going to be in more demand than ever before um, to be able to you know, talk about how do you plan for that. The number two thing is you'll see that a lot of languages and contracts, we've been in middle of renewal discussions where we were talking business terms and all of a sudden there was a line on one of them about COVID-19 and we're like, Oh, this is fantastic. But right now we're literally talking tickets and LED signage. But yeah, we'll definitely address a pandemic and all of those things in the future. So everybody is trying to figure out uh, how to deal with the current situation. And then I'm sure a lot of people are going to start focusing on how do they address this in the future. But I think Kirsten said this, this is unexpected you know, good for, you know, I think when everybody says when Wimbledon and some of the other companies did it was after the SARS scare. Um, others have done it after some of the, the terrorist attacks in, in New York after 9-11. So it's usually been triggered by an event. Uh, it's very rare that somebody gets ahead because how do you expect something of this magnitude? So again, I do think the biggest role that's gonna change a lot is, is crisis management and crisis planning and, and maybe consulting with those type of organizations to figure out what else can you do to you know, protect yourself for whatever scenario might be because we don't know what it could be next. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's the big thing. I mean, if you put in your contract right now, you know, COVID-19 clause, well, who knows what the next pandemic might be. It might be completely different virus, right? Um, Steve, Visa, we all know, is a big supporter of women's football. Um, do you think that due to the change of calendar and the financial impact on, on different stakeholders, women's football might lose its momentum that has been building up to it over the past couple of years? Um, I hope not, but, you know, there's a danger there. 
Um, when, we, when we signed our deal with UEFA, uh, probably about 18 months ago now, I mean, we signed a seven year deal with them because we, we knew it wasn't going to be a quick fix and it was going to be need sustained long term investment to, to try and improve the situation, both in terms of you know, coverage um, and the uh, participation in the sport, um, you know, developing role models, etc. All those things still apply. So in terms of our support of that, then we were always committed to long term. Uh, and we will stay committed to that long term. And I think Visa's got a very good uh, track record of being in sponsorships for a long time. So Olympics, we've been in there for over 30 years. FIFA for probably about 14 years now. Um, so yeah, it's gonna need that sustained um, involvement and investment, but people are gonna have to pivot, I suppose, uh, because of the situation. Um, all I can say is from our point of view, we're still totally committed to helping UEFA grow women's football throughout Europe. So we will continue to invest. We might change some of the communication uh, to fit the, uh, the current situation. So as an, as an example, um, we get, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, UEFA have a women's football channel called We Play Strong. That's their campaign, they have a YouTube channel. Um, as part of our agreement with, uh, with UEFA, we have a vertical called Play Anywhere within that, whereby what we have been doing is we've been having um, Liv Cook, the world uh, champion freestyler, traveling around Europe, uh, talking to people about the women's game, the growth of the women's game, et cetera. That, that isn't really fit for purpose now. You know, the, the time, the, the world has changed. Um, so we've changed totally what we're doing on that. And uh, we launched about three weeks ago um, a, a new vertical called Train at Home, uh, where we've been three times a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays. We've been putting out videos of key players, what they're doing at home in isolation um, to get through the current crisis. Um, I think we've got a couple of Clemence players. Uh, we've got Eugenie Le Sommet tomorrow. Uh, Nikita Paris next week, uh, where they'll be showing videos of you know them training at home and you know how they're passing the time, and I think it's having to change that communication to fit the current scenario. Um, so be adaptable, be resilient, but stay in it for the long term. Great, thanks, Stephen. Kirsten, we we discussed this briefly before, but. Um you know, this idea that some industries will clearly be more impacted by this um, pandemic, but also by the ensuing recession, you know, if, if, we, if we are, um, you know, realistic enough to know that it's going to happen. Um, so some sponsorship categories as such might also be more effective. I mean, just thinking about the airline industry obviously being majorly affected. Um, on the other side, maybe you have the beer category, which is going to come out stronger because um, I think beer sales are, are up uh, because everybody still allowed to go to the supermarket and staying at home. Um, how do you see that play out? And do you think this might you know, significantly impact some of those major brands' uh, ability to invest in the same assets, in the same competitions, for example, looking at Champions League or Europa League? Well, I don't think anybody really knows yet what's going to happen with them and, and the actual impact it will have on their business. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to, to answer that, but we are fortunate enough to partner or UEFA partnering with, with incredible brands and incredible companies, uh, financially very strong companies um, that will certainly be able to continue with some efforts. But what we're trying to support them with is during these times where we just simply cannot deliver some of the content or we also have to massively adapt, like Stephen said. Um, we're trying to come up with ideas of how we can integrate them during this time before we can kick off the matches again. And we see that they, uh, you know, they're thinking about the plans for afterwards. I mean, Heineken just launched a new campaign that talks about, you know, how do you uh, responsibly now hang out with your friends at this time. So, you know, they're all thinking about adapting their campaigns and we will certainly provide them with opportunities to do that on our platforms. I mean, that that's what we can do at the moment. But 
we have uh, great uh, you know trust in, in, in our partners and, and confidence that they will continue to activate with on those platforms because football isn't going to go anywhere you know i football is going to come back as strong as it is now it might take a little bit of time to catch up but uh, you know you're not just going to drop a, a partnership with champions league or europa league because of the, if you don't absolutely have to and we are in the market at the moment where we're selling and uh, for now we're still doing okay so we're we're confident thank you kirsten uh, Clément, speaking of Champions League, obviously Olympique Lyonnais um, is very well known for its Women's Champions League. It has the, the record of, of six uh, UEFA Women's Champions League titles. Um, right. Have you noticed or are you anticipating uh, from your side any, any impact on, on women's football due to COVID-19? Basically, the, the, the women's football is um, at first uh, a commitment, a strong commitment for the last 16 years for, and a vision from our president how to twist a commitment, uh, a twist women football from a commitment to an asset for, for, for the club. And, and now basically the women team, the, the men, the women um, uh, pro team is, is considered uh, as the men team basically. Uh, so they are just training on the same complex and they are considered basically as global athletes into the club. Um, so of course, um, every of our player are, are now professional for, for more than a decade. Um, and um, even if, if um, uh, the, the economics are not the same for men, the women's football, uh, this discipline has been developed so much for, for the last years, uh, and Stefan uh, uh, sp spoke right about it. <laughs> uh, so, so, of course, um, we have to, to take care and, 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 and put the same, the same big process, basically, I would say, uh, uh, on our athletes, on all our athletes. So, so, so that's why we are following them. And um, basically, for us, it is too soon to speak about what would be the exact consequences because the, the absolute priority is to keep the health and, and the good health of, of, of notably the players, the staff, but also all the academy teams and staff because the, the women, the academy is also uh, one of the, the only to, in Europe to, to be mixed. Um, and then basically, of course, uh, we get that will be, uh, they could have uh, consequence on on the club, but for sure the commitment of of of, of OL for women football has been has been strong for for now 16 years, as I said, and 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 won't change basically. Uh, so uh, of course we, we we push our energy to to, to put on, on what it is and, and continue the, the sporting trends and also all the energy and and the concept we develop through women football. Great, thanks. Heidi, what about from, from the CONCACAF uh, area point of view, uh, what's happening there with, with women's football? And actually, I'm going to tie that in with, with a question from uh, Sebastian Decker, who writes us, what about the, the under-20s and under-18s of the world? I know for a fact that um, Panama and Costa Rica were supposed to, under, uh, to organize the under-20 women's uh, championships uh, later in the year. What's, uh, what's, what's happening on, uh, from CONCACAF there? Yeah, so specific to the first part of the question with women's football, I think uh, very similar to what Steven said, it's a it's a huge priority. And, uh, you know, every week we have our leadership call and, and we talk about women's football because we don't want to make sure that with all of this, it gets lost or, or pushed further down. Um, so I think there is an overarching commitment. Uh, FIFA has continued to stress their commitment to continue to grow women's football. And there's a committee dedicated to speak specifically around how to address uh, the impact of COVID-19 to women's football. So there's a lot of discussion there. Uh, I think the biggest thing we're all seeing, uh, as Stephen alluded to, is the calendar, right? When are a lot of these women's competitions going to take place? Uh, luckily for us, the, the impact to us for this year was minimal because our, our biggest women's competition is in 22. So that will continue as schedule. Uh, we had a couple of our youth competitions this year. Some of those are going to get shifted into later into the fall or potentially spring of 21, depending on, again, when it's safe for us to go back to playing football. Uh, as we talked about at the beginning, for us, we have to be able to uh, travel. Um, because we have to bring teams from across our region to different countries. So uh, a critical to us is the opening of borders, and that's going to really dictate uh, when we're able to really host a lot of our competitions. The good thing is that FIFA has shifted the timing for their World Cups. So uh, the World Cup that was going to be in India in November will be shifted 
um, a date hasn't been announced, the women's under 20 uh, in that was gonna be shared between Panama and Costa Rica is also gonna be shipped. So by doing that, that's really open uh, the opportunity for all of us to come in and be able to execute our events as well. So uh, at this point, um, the expectation and the hope is that uh, as this crisis passes, we'll be able to really get many of our competitions done. Some of it might, uh, if you probably heard our president, Victor Montegliani talk about this for the last few weeks, it might require us looking at some formats of the competition in order to be able to squeeze everything in but our, that's what our intent is and definitely uh, we can't lose sight of, of those two points which is women's football and youth sports that's the future it's, it's important for for the development uh, so I know as a confederation we're very committed to ensuring uh, that that's a top priority the minute we're able to go back and, and play football thank you Heidi Steve, um, can you provide some insights as to, because I mean, you, you alluded to the fact that obviously, yeah, you, you've shifted your, your budgets and your activities for the, the properties that you currently own, but could this situation affect your, your approach to sponsorship at all long term? Like, would you, um, is this maybe the time to, for a brand, you know, to start considering looking at other properties, esports maybe? What, what's your take on that? Well, I think, I think it's worth thinking. So I mentioned um, a while ago, you know, th these are sponsors, the biggest sporting events in the world. So, you know, FIFA, Olympics, NFL, UEFA Women's Football. Why, why do we do that? Why do we do that as a business? Why do we spend so much of our marketing money on acquiring sponsorship properties? Um, I suppose there's two main reasons for that. So from a consumer point of view, if you think about payments, payments are not something that every day a consumer normally thinks about. Currently, they probably do. They're probably thinking about, uh, can I pay contactless or can I pay from home? And everything. But in a normal situation, it's something that they just take for granted. It's quite invisible. They just pay for stuff. They don't even think about it. When we can associate payment with a passion point, like football, like Olympics, etc., then that really does capture people's imagination. So from a consumer point of view, Visa really, really does value um, sponsorship properties because they can add something by association. Second point, uh, from a business point of view, then it's hugely impactful for, for Visa. So in all of our sponsorship uh, negotiations, we negotiate pass-through rights for our clients. So to all the banks around the world, to merchants around the world, we can pass through some of that IP for Olympics, for FIFA World Cup, et cetera, which is hugely valuable from the business to business point of view for Visa. So looking forward, those two things aren't gonna change. You know, clients are still going to value being associated with the biggest properties around the world. Consumers are still going to have the passion for the biggest sporting events around the world. So from a Visa point of view, those two things don't change. Yes, is there going to be slight differences? So as you mentioned, you know, esports, is that something that's going to grow? Of course it's going to grow. Uh, and that is something that we're also associated with through our FIFA tournaments um, and also um, outside of that as well. So yes, it will change, um, it will evolve, but those core tenets of people really wanting to follow the biggest sporting events around the world, that's not going to change. Just how they follow them, might change slightly. Great, thanks, thanks, Steve, for answering that question. Um, Kirsten, obviously, there's a lot of uh, speculation as well, or maybe realistic anticipation of the fact that a lot of games will be played behind closed door for the foreseeable future. Uh, right now, clearly, nobody knows how long that might take for. Uh, whether we have to wait until a vaccine, or whether each government will uh, will decide that on its own. Um, but how are you working with partners so that they can still activate their brands in a, in a meaningful way and in a, in a relevant way? Um, do you think they will focus more on, on the online strategies, um, on media, or will there still be an opportunity to activate in that type of environment where you know those, some of those biggest Champions League matches are played behind closed doors? Well, ideally there would be, um, but we just don't know yet. So the focus is definitely on, on digital activation from everybody. Um, and, you know, UEFA has very uh, successful social channels 
Um, so that is a fantastic platform for partners to do more on and we'll, we'll certainly um, support that. And then there's still the question of will some things be possible to be done that matches? I mean, all our partners have sole and exclusive rights. Uh, will, will it be possible that some of those can be activated in, in certain markets or not? Uh, we're just going to have to see and, and wait what the decision is. And, you know, obviously UEFA will rely very heavily on, on the government in every single country on, on what the guidance is and what they're allowed to do. So, yes, digital, definitely more, but we're hopeful that some things can still be done on site. Time will tell. Um, Clement, back to you. And um, my question is, at the end of last year, um, the Olympic Lyonnais group acquired FC Rain. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a club in the National Women's uh, Soccer League in the US, right? And uh, as such, that league was supposed to start this weekend, actually, um, but obviously it didn't. What can you tell us more about the plans that the, the group had for, for, for that inauguration and for the, for the women's team at Rain uh, going forward? Yes, for sure. I'm, as you say, basically how we can build the relevant link and synergies between two of the biggest club, uh, one in Europe, one in US. Um, we all spoke about uh, previously about how women's football is growing and how is it going a priority for everyone. Um, as I said, it is a long term commitment uh, and project from the club. And, and so it has appeared as a new step. Uh, for the clubs to develop um, Olympic Lyonnais um, differently internationally uh, and through the women's side. So it was um, a strong objective from the president. And when the occasion came, it, it was, uh, we, we thought it was the right project. That's why the club decided to, to acquire uh, almost 90% uh, uh, of, uh, of the club, of uh, Seattle Reigns, which now is called OL Reigns to make the links. And, and so basically the, the project for us is global, is not only commercial, is not extending only the brand, is not making a subsidiary, is really to develop two leading club in two key markets of, of women football into the world. Um, and so we, we try to develop the synergies um, and we have started to do it um, on each side. So, so first of course, it is, it's continuing and strengthening the project which has been developed by the Bill Prenmore, uh, which was the, the, the former uh, main shareholder, we still the, the CEO and shareholder of the club, and to continue to bring the, the additional keys it was needed to the project. So on, on the women's side, uh, I mean the first team side, first to continue to, to strengthen uh, the means and and, uh, and and whole aspects. So one of the key key step has been um, the venue of our one of our former coach uh, from raising the Royal Academy called Farin Bed City, and which is one of the reference now in, in, in women's football. Uh, so now he, he will start as the head coach of the club. We continue to have synergies between the, the two staff, and notably the implication of Gerard Ouye, which is one of the head of the women football project for the clubs. So he, he ensures that all the rights and formation and, and means are, 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 are continue. And, and first, and I mean in, in the second time, also, one of the key projects for us um, will be the academy. So continue to write and develop a sustainable youth education model in the United States. Aligning the two, the, the two markets and strengths, um, so there will be cooperation, and, and it was forecast to, to send one of our head of academy soon uh, to continue to work on, on this project because Rain is, is one of key key clubs in the in the National Women's Soccer League, but but is is still uh, expecting for de developing its own premises, uh, own fields to 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 continue to perform. So so that's also part of the project. And, and one notable point also for us is, of course, the commitment of Tony Parker into the project, uh, because of course, into the, the expansion uh, and development strategy the club tries to develop through his own infrastructures, through different acquisition. Uh, there was a, a big, you know, uh, friendly and, and pact with, uh, between our president and, and Tony Parker. Uh, and now TP is an is a international ambassador for OL brand, in, notably in the United States. And of course, he took part into the project. So of course, it is a um, continuity and we will try to, to, to adapt what works from the whole women's side uh, in Lyon um, to the Seattle uh, side and, and try to adapt it for, for, the best, uh, for the best results. 
Great. Thank you. I do wish you the best for, for that uh, development there as well. Thank you very much. Uh, it will be as success, uh, success, successful as, um, as your team efforts in, in Europe. Um, Heidi, how do you bounce back from all this? After all of this is said and done, after we've resumed the competitions, how, how do sports properties bounce back from this? And if, if you want to go into detail, like who, who is your sounding board? Like who are the people that you talk with to, to find out whether you're doing the right things, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the first of all, um, you have to believe and have faith and hope that we will bounce back. Um, I think we spent a lot of time talking about the, you know, I think, uh, again, Stephen talked about why they invest in sponsorships, right? It's that emotional connection. And, and, and we truly believe that if you look through history, sports has played such a pivotal role in us going back to uh, being human again and, and getting back to some sort of normalcy. Um, you saw it after a lot of the world wars in, in, in the 40s. Um, the role that sport played in, in the United States in particular, sport played a critical role after the attacks of 9-11. So we truly believe that sport has the ability to unite us. Um, it has the ability to help us heal. Um, and, and that really is the power of sport. You know, I always talk about not to dismiss all my other friends in, in the other industries, but, you know, the minute this is over, people are not debating when are we all cramming into a movie theater to see the next movie, right? Nobody's, you know, talking about that. Um, but they are talking about it. And, you know, think about it. There's a lot of people now watching like highlights and esports and all these things because they miss it so much. You know, this is something that is so critical to their lives. Uh, one of my colleagues, he's been watching the one league in Belarus that is playing football right now, you know, and, and because it's such a, a strong passion. So that's what we hang on to, the fact that we believe in the power of sports. Our partners believe in the power of sports. That's why they invest the kind of money that they do. So that's what we want to do. We want to use uh, football as part of that narrative to get people back to feeling like themselves, to be able to come together with their friends and their families at the appropriate time to share on this bond. Um, I think the critical part for it is what do we learn from it? You know, what do we learn from it as a society and what do we learn from it as uh, people in the sports industry? So it will definitely be interesting to see uh, what comes out of it in terms of security measures at venues. Um, I think it will be interesting to see, um, you know, what uh, the evolution is in terms of expectations there, in terms of medical staff at, at venues and, and, and things of that nature. So all of that will be very interesting to monitor. Uh, but I definitely do believe that we'll get back will be stronger than ever. And you know, you've seen some of the surveys that say people are gonna be hesitant to come out first until there's a vaccine. Um, obviously, uh, you know, at some point, a lot of bright minds are working on a vaccine. So we'll be able to get a vaccine um, and we'll be able to do that. So maybe we just uh, don't go back all in one force with 40, 50, 60,000 people, but maybe we can get back to sport little by little and hopefully give time for the, the healthcare officials to work on things, get a vaccine, uh, make some new protocols so that we can be back in, in full business uh, next year. Definitely. Let's, let's hope for the best and, and see how it plays out. Uh, Steven, there's actually a, a follow-up question to, to what you previously said um, from a guy called Jordi Mestre. Um, he's asking, what, uh, what do you think esports might offer? Oh, sorry. The question is, do you think esports might offer someday an equivalent ROI to that of live events? Or is that something you don't expect to happen? Uh, good question. Um, I don't think we know at this stage. Um, it's certainly going to grow and um, it can offer great opportunities for brands and different opportunities as well. Um, I think if ever it was going to thrive, now is the time. So I think that time is now. Um, who knows? Who knows? We're, we're looking at it. Uh, we're involved in certain projects um, through our association with, with FIFA. Um, we have access to, to various properties. Um, but I think um, the next five years are going to show huge opportunities. Who knows? I, I don't know the answer to that question. If somebody does, please tell me and we can invest appropriately. Sounds like a fair, uh, fair thing to do. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Kirsten, we also have a question from the audience for you, from uh, Nicole Allison. Um, she asks you, that you mentioned that actually that team doesn't work with the Women's Champions League. Um, she's asking, yeah, do you know why that is or will that change in the future? Well, UEFA has a model where they were, uh, work with different agencies on different properties. And uh, we used to uh, look after the Women's Champions League final um in terms of of marketing it and and then uh, also with the sponsorship but uh, that was taken out of of the champions league package because it was part of the champions league package and it was put in a separate women's program which is being very successful um and uh, a good decision we're, su we're still selling the media rights at the moment um but you know we we love women's football and we we we'd love to be uh we'd love to be involved we think there's a great future for that so um who knows what the future brings but yeah let's see and uh Clément, just um one more question for you obviously dealing with the international uh department at a club means that you know you have different let's say uh alliances as you mentioned across the world a lot of that, again, will depend on when the pandemic uh, goes back to, to zero almost, let's say, in different parts of the world. What, uh, what kind of like new trends do you foresee in terms of the international development strategies of, of football clubs? You, you mean regarding the, the, the Korean pandemic uh, aspect? Yes, yes. Yeah, so obviously it's going to take a while before people can, can travel um, around the world um, and then again, you know, depending on, 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 on the priorities of the, the people in that country, how, how, how much of an effect do you think it will happen on, on clubs' international strategies? Well, it's really hard to see um, and, and hard to, 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 to think about what would be exactly the consequences into the months, what has been said for sure. Uh, there will be consequences, I mean, on, on process, on habits, on way to work. For instance, we are doing those kind of web, uh, webinars and, and learn to use many applications to do web conferences. <laughs> so, of course, I think maybe uh, e-learning will regain more and more situation, while I think digital um, will continue to maybe get more important because people will be maybe more concentrated and, and less distracted by, by different aspects. Um, so, yeah, regarding international development, um, it, it must doesn't does not uh, it must not prevent uh, sorry uh, clubs to do things and and we continue actively to to try to prepare future uh, and we hope to 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 announce uh, uh, good news and to, to into the the next weeks um, and of course if we get back and and after um, uh, once this the football will we, we, be back uh, on the on the table of sure uh, we need to see how we can adapt uh, to those trends and and which lesson we we, we must uh, uh, take from from this incredible situation for sure yeah definitely um great then um to wrap up i would like to ask all of you um the same question actually and, and see if uh if the perspectives uh, are different or whether they are aligning um so heidi I'll, I'll begin with you of course and then the same question will apply to everyone else how do you feel the, the sponsorship landscape will will um will change moving forward and maybe identify one key opportunity that, that, that you think is gonna come out on the back of it? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a great question. I think there's a couple of things that are, are possible. Um, I definitely do believe that there's gonna be a potential, I think Kirsten talked a little bit about this, of, of partners taking a step back and trying to think about their asset mix a little bit different uh, in terms of how much they do in terms of live assets that are happening in stadium or outside of the stadium from a fan festival perspective versus how much they're trying to bring into um, the online digital space, social media. Also, I think one of the things that you've seen uh, is that through this crisis, the leagues and the clubs have been able to really activate their athletes, their players in a, a way that they hadn't really done before. So I think that's gonna establish a certain level of expectation. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see, um, you know, now that people have gotten the opportunity to interact more directly with the athletes, that hopefully that's something that could it will become a, a requirement moving forward in a lot of partnerships. And now obviously the mindset is gonna shift because right now everybody's in that mode of, of participating and giving 
But once we're back to football, it's going to change a little bit of the narrative of how you engage with athletes uh, based on, on their availability and, and, and how they approach their own personal brand and their partnerships. So I think that's where I see some of the most immediate change potentially is people really rethinking their asset mix that they put in the partnerships uh, to adapt to potentially uh, evolving uh, consumption part patterns. Interesting. Steve, what's your take on all of this? Um, well, without being repetitive, um, I think there will be a proportion of people that, that rethink, do they really want to travel to the other side of the world to attend an event? Um, or do they want to get that same feeling by staying at home? So I think far more companies, uh, brands will look to try and develop experiences but within the, their own locality rather than people traveling around the world. Football might be a little bit different to other sports on that because I think people want to be at a football ground. Uh, but certainly for other sports, you can see that that, that might be a trend. Uh, one thing that might change, I mean, just a, a small thing that might change. Um, we were talking a little bit about women's football and, you know, is this going to hamper the growth of women's football? There was an article over the weekend um, talking about the Women's Super League in, in England uh, and how they're going to finish the season. So are they going to play that behind closed doors? Uh, there was a thought um, that it might all be played in one venue over a, a period of time. Um, what better opportunity, if there's going to be no crowds there, film all that, televise it, put it online, you probably get a much bigger audience than you would get in the live audience. So. I think there are opportunities out there and people shouldn't see this just as difficulties. There will definitely be opportunities arising as well. Great, thank you, Steve, as well. Kirsten, your perspective on, uh, on the shifts in the commercial landscape and, and specifically one, one exciting opportunity that, that you first. Mm -hmm. I think an opportunity is to go back to where it was. Um, Honestly, I, I, I think the point that Heidi made in terms of the athletes and, and how much they shared and how much closer you got to them, I think um, I think that's a very interesting trend and I, I agree with you. I think that, that is maybe here to stay. But I, on a, I mean, I don't know, but I don't expect massive changes for big properties um, because people still gonna wanna be there. Um, Football fans are very passionate. I think they're going to want to be close to the action. They're going to want to be at the World Cup. They're going to want to be at a Euro. They want to go to a Champions League stadium. So I'm not really sure that much is going to change long term. I'm sure there's going to be some, you know, thinking around better digital assets and more digital assets. And how can you engage fans, uh, you know, with not having to go to the stadium. But I can also imagine that maybe in 12, 20 months from now, things may not change that dramatically for the big properties. Okay, thank you. And Clément, to finish, what's your perspective on uh, the future developments of the sponsorship landscape? Uh, I mean, for a sponsorship landscape, it, it would be hard for me to answer because it's not my part. <laughs> but. Um, but for sure, I think that this situation will we, we'll, uh, permit to reveal maybe new, uh, either, as we said, um, new creativity uh, to activate, to replace the existing solutions. And I think also, uh, even if uh, fans are really passionate about football, um, the demand will become higher and higher because, because uh, we see that people want to, to live and live more those experiences going to the stadium to or behind the TV, uh, in front of TV. So I don't know what would be exactly the same thing. I don't think maybe there will be major twists uh, in, in commercial activation, but of course, uh, um, I think the experience will be placed uh, more and more into the, um, into the essence, I think, of the cooperation. And I think that's the most important. Let's hope for the best. And with this, uh, it's time to wrap up. I want to thank all four of you um, from the bottom of my heart for, for your participation. So Heidi Pejerano from CONCACAF, Stephen um, Lee from Visa, Kirsten Lutz from Team Marketing, and Clément Michon from Olympique Lyonnais. Thank you, everybody, as well, for tuning in. Apologies again for the slight delay and technical issues at the beginning, but no worries. This whole session is recorded. So if you uh, caught in later, then you can still watch 
um, the whole recording later tonight or in the next few days. You can share it with friends, families, and colleagues. Um, as such, uh, do stay tuned on our social media channels on Thursday, five o'clock European time, as we'll announce episode six. In the meantime, thanks for watching and stay safe.